Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this webinar on the future CO2 legislation for cars uh, and strategies for compliance. Uh, my name's Murray Paul. I'll be your host uh, and moderator for today. I work at Jaguar Land Rover, uh, and I'm a senior legislation and compliance strategy manager. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, uh, and the on-demand uh, recording will be circulated out to members about seven to ten days after we close today. Um, you will have an overview panel on your right-hand side. Um, please use the questions if you require any technical support uh, throughout, um, and one of the team will come back to you directly. I'd also remind uh, that questions can be raised uh, throughout, um, and, and we will address those uh, when we get to the end. Um, the actual presentation will take around about half an hour, and we have then have half an hour uh, for questions at the back end. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Zara. Uh, first of all, Zara currently works in the strategy team uh, at Jaguar Land Rover as a CO2 emission strategy analyst. Her focus is on EU and UK regulations, uh, modeling the impacts of various regulations and driving the company's strategy forward uh, for meeting CO2 targets. As she has a master's in chemical engineering and has previously worked in automotive and also fast moving consumable goods industries. Uh, and she do do has done that as a manufacturing process engineer. And I'll now hand over to Zara. Hello everyone, my name is Zara Shahid and I work in the Carbon Dioxide Compliance Strategy Team at Jaguar Land Rover. Today I'll be giving you an insight into one of the biggest transitions car manufacturers are having to tend, contend with today. We're now in a world where climate is dominating every agenda. Just in the past few weeks, both the UK and US have announced increased greenhouse gas reduction targets and transport emissions are too big a piece of the pie to ignore. And when governments change their own goalposts, this leaves car manufacturers to navigate a legal landscape that is constantly in flux. As car manufacturers cannot rely on the targets when they are set to remain set at that same ambition, we're in a time where the need to preempt that next step is very much required by the strategy teams in these countries. Today, I hope to give you an insight into what that world looks like, to take you through what this legal landscape looks like today, what it will look like in the future, how car manufacturers are responding to it, and the consequences of car manufacturers falling behind and the risks of backing the wrong horse. We start with the world as it exists today. And though there is a patchwork of regulations out there, they are all ultimately guiding car manufacturers in the same direction. The markets I've highlighted in dark green are the big three. These are the biggest passenger car markets globally, and they all regulate carbon dioxide or the carbon dioxide equivalent measure in some way or form. The EU legislates car manufacturers to reach an average carbon dioxide target for their entire fleet. China regulates fuel consumption, which is directly related to the amount of carbon dioxide emitted by a car, and the US regulates both carbon dioxide and fuel economy. The lighter green markets are the smaller markets by comparison, and they have their own fleet targets that car manufacturers need to meet. These carbon dioxide targets around the world are only increasing in stringency. Whilst it is no doubt an engineering challenge to bring down the carbon dioxide of the vehicles in the fleet, it's also a commercial challenge, a financial challenge, and a strategic challenge to meet the various targets in the various markets by ensuring the right products are on sale in the right places and are being sold in the right proportion. An important point to note is that the only emission regulated in these markets is the tailpipe carbon dioxide emission. And that is whatever is coming out of the tailpipe whilst the car is being driven. Cars like battery electric and fuel cell vehicles have no tailpipe carbon dioxide emissions. And this means by this metric, these are the best cars 
that can be sold by car manufacturers to meet these targets. Another point to note is that generally speaking, diesels emit less carbon dioxide than their petrol equivalents, almost unique to Europe where diesels are so much more prevalent than in China and in the US, this becomes an important compliance lever for some manufacturers. Now that we understand where carbon dioxide is regulated, we need to understand that it is prohibitively expensive to fall behind on achieving these targets. Numbers like 86 pounds per gram per kilometer in the UK and $140 per mile per gallon in the US can add up to hundreds of millions in fines when applied to a car manufacturer's fleet. In China and the US, car manufacturers face being unable to have non-compliant cars on sale, which will lead to hundreds of millions in lost revenue. Car manufacturers must weigh up these costs with the cost of fitting carbon dioxide efficient technologies with the cost in compliance in other ways. And by offset in compliance in other ways, I mean by going down the route of taking advantage of car manufacturers over compliance. In all three major markets, there is a mechanism in the legislation whereby a car manufacturer falling behind on achieving their own targets can pay another car manufacturer that is over compliant to offset their own non-compliance. Looking at the first headline on this slide, both Honda and Fiat paid Tesla to take advantage of Tesla's battery electric vehicle fleet, which of course emits no tailpipe carbon dioxide emissions. And this is to avoid paying fines to the European Union for non-compliance. And this is serious business for Tesla. They made $1.58 billion in 2020 from such deals globally. The balance car manufacturers are weighing up in reality is whether it's cheaper to invest in their own vehicles with carbon dioxide saving technologies or pay government expensive fines or to pay a lesser sum of money to fund their competitors. The truth is that it is never a single answer for car manufacturers and they end up exploring all of these compliance options. BW spent 14 billion euros on R&D in 2019. They outspent all of their competitors and still they paid other manufacturers to take advantage of their overcompliance against carbon dioxide targets in the UK, like Honda and Fiat paid Tesla. And they still ended up with a fine of more than 100 million euros for non-compliance in 2020. Compliance is an expensive game to play. To add another layer of complexity, we are entering the age of the decline of the internal combustion engine. Or to be more precise, the banning of the internal combustion engine by governments. This is not a natural consumer shift, but this is governments taking drastic action to lower transport emissions to meet their greenhouse gas reduction ambitions. Markets like the UK will ban anything with a combustion engine from 2035. California also has a 2035 ban. If you're selling cars in Europe, you now have to contend with countries like Norway with an ambition to phase out fossil fuel cars by 2025 and France and Spain with ambitions around 2040. Primary markets are all headed in the same direction, and that direction is electric. So on top of the primary legislation, which, le which regulates the carbon dioxide of a car manufacturer's fleet, there is an additional layer of regulation that promotes electric vehicles. In China and the US, a certain percentage of your fleet needs to be electric. In the EU, there is a benchmark which unlocks certain benefits once you sell above a certain EV share. The UK is currently rewriting its regulations in a post-Brexit world. 
and some form of mandate on car manufacturers to sell a certain percentage of their fleet as electric is almost certainly on the table. City bans add yet another layer of complexity. How do you sell a car in Belgium with no national plans to ban the internal combustion engine when their capital city of Brussels has said they will ban internal combustion engines from 2030? How can car manufacturers now work out how that will influence um, consumer decisions in the coming years? Market fragmentation means more unique customer use cases and car manufacturers need a solution for every use case. This is tricky and expensive for car manufacturers to manage. So how are car manufacturers responding? Some car manufacturers are preempting the national announcement with some announcements of their own. They are taking the plunge and backing a single horse. Volvo intend to go fully electric with all of their sales globally from 2030 and to be climate neutral in 2050. Specifically for Europe, Ford will only be selling battery electric passenger cars from 2030 and will go global with carbon neutrality for 2050. GM have aims to have zero gram per kilometer tailpipe emissions from 2035 and carbon neutrality for 2040. Jaguar Land Rover, where I of course work, has a similar timescale with no internal combustion engines from 2036 and wider net zero emissions from 2039. Honda, who aren't listed on this slide, who have only just announced their plans of battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles only from 2040. Even car manufacturers who aren't as forthcoming in their plans are headed in the same direction. The end goal of climate neutrality in 2050 is clear for governments and car manufacturers alike. Some car manufacturers are just holding their strategic cards on how to get there closer to their chest. This is a huge industry transition with multiple routes to reach the end goal of climate neutrality. For some manufacturers, keeping those avenues open is key as discussions with legislators take place on the next steps. How can car manufacturers get there? What are the strategies being used for compliance? Now we've already spoken about the option to pay another company to take advantage of their overcompliance. That's not what I want to talk about here. More about how a company can achieve compliance on their own two feet. How can car manufacturers balance the various legislative requirements with investments in their fleet? Really, there are two car manufacturers that illustrate this best. There's been a lot of talk on 2020 in Europe in this slideshow, and that is because in 2020, the carbon dioxide targets got a lot tougher for car manufacturers to achieve. There was a huge increase in stringency for the target in 2020 the European fleet on average needed to hit the magic 95 grams per kilometer carbon dioxide number. Throughout the year, there was a lot of speculation on which manufacturers would be non-compliant. We've already spoken about how VW have fallen afoul and are paying fines. You can really get a feel for the compliance strategies available to car manufacturers just by looking at this table. Now, one manufacturer that has always been treated as best in class throughout is, of course, Toyota, a brand virtually synonymous with their hybrid strategy. There was never any doubt about Toyota's ability to meet their carbon dioxide targets, and that's because their long-term strategy has always been centered around efficient hybrid electric vehicles, and they have absolutely no reliance on diesel. Following the VW emission scandal, diesel sales have drastically fallen in Europe. So any manufacturers relying on diesels to carry them through the 2020 target reduction had their plans ripped up. Toyota saved themselves from this by cutting diesels from their fleet much earlier. In fact, Toyota have been so comfortable in reaching their targets 
that Mazda have an arrangement with them to take advantage of their ERWA compliance. Contrast this now with Daimler, a manufacturer that very much has diesels in their fleet. Daimler were widely expected to struggle to reach their 2020 targets, but have since announced that they will be compliant. What has led to this compliance is a huge ramp up in electric vehicle sales. From selling just 3% of their fleet as electric in Europe from 2019, in 2019, in 2020, a fifth of their fleet was electric. You can now clearly see how Toyota invested in their internal combustion engine vehicles to turn them into hybrids, where Daimler took the electric route of increasing their sales mix of electric vehicles. The problem with Daimler's route here lies in the cost of electrification. There is a huge cost associated with the propulsion system in your battery electric vehicle that doesn't exist in the internal combustion engine. I'm talking, of course, about the battery itself. Electric vehicles are hugely expensive to make in comparison to your regular petrol engine. And as you can imagine, customers are not happy to absorb that cost, meaning the cost more often than not gets absorbed by the car manufacturer. Why is this a problem? Well, there's two consequences here. Governments are clearly pointing in one direction, that direction being electric. To get to this brand new electric world, car manufacturers need to be able to invest in their massive R&D budget to put out an electric offering that the customer actually wants. An ironic truth is that for car manufacturers to be able to sell electric cars, they first need to be able to sell internal combustion engines. And at this current moment for car manufacturers, similar to how we saw Daimler do, to push electrification is a costly affair. Until this cost balance is addressed, it will mean less availability for car manufacturers to invest in their own products. And of course, all the societal benefits of that investment is similarly affected. The second consequence is that car companies ha that can absorb this electrification cost are the premium manufacturers which again points to why Daimler were able to take the route that they took. Battery electric technology is too expensive for small cars to turn a profit, but the bigger and more expensive cars can absorb that cost. It means they make less profit, of course, but it shows why car manufacturers are electrifying the top end of their fleet before the mass market end. This, of course, also has a trickle-down effect on the society. In terms of strategies for compliance, car manufacturers need to be able to invest in electric vehicles. That much is more than clear. They also need to be able to sell internal combustion engine cars to do so. If not, they will not turn a profit and they will not have any money to reinvest into the next generation of green cars. However, to sell internal combustion engine vehicles, they also need to be able to invest in them. A customer will not pay a premium for a technology that has remained stagnant. All this means is car manufacturers are stretched too thinly. Hence why some car manufacturers have openly stated which horse they are backing with their intentions to stop selling internal combustion engine vehicles by a certain date. They are unlocking that R&D cash and spending it on what they perceive to be the winning horse, the electric vehicle. Now let's quickly have a look at the results of the regulation. Surprise, surprise, the legislation looks like it works. Carbon dioxide emissions from passenger cars have drastically fallen in the European Union. And in 2020, when the target grew more stringent, there was another drop in the carbon dioxide emissions of the European fleet. It's a similar story in the US. The regulation works a little differently out there, but to the same end, a huge reduction in the carbon dioxide emissions from the fleet. In China, the regulations have led to China being the biggest market for electric vehicles. And thanks to the increased stringency in targets 
for the EU in 2020, it is quickly catching up. So now that we know the regulations exist in the big markets and that they are achieving the government's goals of lowering carbon dioxide and increasing electric vehicle sales, and that we've talked about the various balls car manufacturers need to juggle when deciding when and how to meet the target, the next question is, what will we see next? The obvious one is energy consumption targets for electric vehicles. For how long can the energy consumption of electric vehicles be ignored? China are actually the first to enact something in this space, where energy consumption is factored into the NEV credit calculation. Whilst it's not a direct regulation on electric vehicles to maintain a certain efficiency, it is encouraging car manufacturers to consider this in their vehicles. It makes complete sense that China would be the first on this horse as this will be a key issue for maintaining energy security in the future. The worry for car manufacturers is quite simply over-regulation. We know governments want electric vehicles. Legislating them is just another hurdle to their development and sale. And this will possibly stagger sales when in this early stage of technology adoption, we really need to be promoting them using every means. Another issue is the gap between test cycle and real world carbon dioxide. To meet the carbon dioxide target, car manufacturers are regulated according to the vehicle driven under a certain set of conditions. These are your test cycles. There has always been a gap between this test cycle carbon dioxide and what the car achieves in real life. There are so many variables when driving that there will always be a gap. Regulators try and make this test representative of a general driving scenario by updating the test cycles. In this new age of data we live in, where you can get data for everything and anything, and cars themselves have never been more connected, the European Commission has clued on to taking the carbon dioxide of the vehicle directly from the car itself. Now, of course, it won't actually work like this, but think about the average fuel economy and therefore carbon dioxide of your daily drive being logged and sent to the commission, and the carbon dioxide of a car manufacturer's fleet being dependent on this. Now, this is without a doubt the most accurate representation of carbon dioxide from transport. But the problem is in this being used to legislate car manufacturers. There are so many factors that affect the fuel economy and carbon dioxide of a vehicle. The most obvious being a customer's driving behavior. How can car manufacturers be held responsible for how their customers drive their cars? And is, if they are, what will this mean for cars being designed in the future? Finally, another trend very much taking over the carbon dioxide for transport world is to no longer look at just the vehicle, the vehicle tailpipe emissions, but to look at the entire life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for that vehicle. This has become a trend now for a number of reasons, one of which is the rise of electric vehicles. Of course, when looking at only tailpipe emissions, electric vehicles are a winner. They have no emissions. Fuel cell vehicles only emit water, but when you start to look at the battery raw material extraction and even recycling, things start to look a lot less green. Also, the supply of energy. Internal combustion engines might have the tag of dirty oil hanging around, but electric vehicles are only truly zero when they are powered by 100% renewable energy. This is also another thing that the European Union has specifically said they will look at, the possibility of developing a common methodology for consistent reporting of full life cycle carbon dioxide emissions of cars with the option of adding a legislative element. The problem here is that it is simply too complicated. When you start to look at car manufacturing in detail, 
even where the car is manufactured and where the steel and aluminium comes from comes into question. You really can't compare what car manufacturers publish on this because their underlying assumptions and calculations aren't standardized. To account for every single component on a car and where it has come from is a huge ask, which is why before legislating, the commission is looking into whether or not it is even possible. However, as we move into a world where the language is net zero and more and more companies are signing up to these types of commitments, life cycle analysis is not going away anytime soon. So to recap, carbon dioxide targets are becoming more and more stringent, and car manufacturers have to meet them. Why? Because non-compliance is expensive. To avoid non-compliance, car manufacturers can opt for lots of different routes. Internally, that means deciding whether their R&D budget is best spent on improving combustion engine efficiency or going all in on electric vehicles. The latter argument is strengthened by the internal combustion ban announcements that are taking place around the globe. Why would a car manufacturer invest in a technology that will be defunct in 15 years? That's two product cycles in the car manufacturer language. But then how can car manufacturers fund the move to an electric world without selling and investing in their more profitable internal combustion engines? And lastly, as I started this presentation, stating both the UK and US have tightened their greenhouse gas reduction ambitions when the goalposts are constantly changing. How can car manufacturers make long-term decisions? This really brings us to the end of today's webinar, which was intended to be an introduction and taster to the world of carbon dioxide compliance and hopefully provide some framing for some of the big announcements and big decisions being made by car manufacturers, which are all being driven by carbon dioxide targets. There is no easy answer to all of this, and I hope that is very much what I managed to articulate. The car world is very much in flux when it comes to carbon dioxide emissions, so watch this space. I'd now like to open the floor for any questions you might have um, for us to try and answer. Uh, thank you very much, Zara. Um, very good. We've got a, a few questions uh, that, have, that have come in over the course of your presentation. Um, the first question is from Mary, and she asks, is it sustainable for demand and electrification to be driven by CO2 legislation? Um, thanks, Mary. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that is a bit of a tricky one, but the short answer is, is that it's it's not sustainable. It is not sustainable for the only driver in markets to be CO2 legislation to push electrification. The shift to electrification needs to be consumer-led. Governments are left in a bit of a tricky situation of how to make consumers want an electric car. And of course, there's a lot to sell. How do you convince somebody who's making a 400-mile trip um, that their journey is now going to be 40 minutes longer because they need to stop and charge? What if there isn't a driveway for these people to charge their cars on at home? What if electric cars pale in comparison to combustion engine vehicles in terms of key vehicle attributes? What if customers just don't like the look of the electric cars on the market? And how can you ask consumers to pay more for expensive technology that exists in an electric car? And a all of these concerns that need to be answered to, to, to make that shift to electrification, only one of them is directly influenced by car manufacturers. And that is um, by putting these CO2 standards all car, on car manufacturers, it's forcing car manufacturers to compete with each other to put a more competitive product on the market, which will hopefully appeal to more customers. This doesn't address the cost disparity between the technologies, so governments have to figure out how to bridge that gap with some sort of grant or a rebate. This doesn't address concerns around infrastructure, so governments have a huge role to play to ensure everyone has access to a charging station, that they are reliable, that they're easy to use, that they're fit for purpose. 
Now, if the shift to electrification isn't treated in a holistic way, you will have car manufacturers investing in low carbon electric vehicle technology that no one wants to buy. And it's key for governments to understand that as they set this legislation. Great, thank you. Um, we've, got, we've got another question from Brian. Um, is there a future uh, for internal combustion engines with synthetic fuels? Um, so, in theory, on paper, looking at synthetic fuels to fuel combustion engine cars makes complete sense. The car you're driving today could be combusting a very low carbon fuel, meaning the net emissions of your drive could be next to zero. And um, some car manufacturers have very much left this option open. Porsche are actively pursuing this option. Other car manufacturers see it as a route to decarbonization, but just not a plausible one. And this is, I guess, for two reasons. Firstly, many governments have given up the guise of technology neutrality. The UK government has said cars from 2035 need to have zero tailpipe emissions. That already eliminates the possibility of synthetic fuels taking off in the passenger car market. And secondly, we're not the only ones in the race to net zero. This is affecting all industries. Synthetic fuels are likely to be prioritized for harder to electrify industries like the aviation and the heavy goods vehicle industries. And so for passenger cars to be eligible for the internal combustion engine to survive on passenger cars, both of these issues need to be addressed and car manufacturers have got little influence over these. And so while synthetic fuels are an option to compliance um, and an option that a lot of car manufacturers have left this door open to, it will involve a holistic approach to take off by fuel suppliers and governments that does not exist today. Great. Um, we've had a number of questions on life cycle analysis and you touched on that at the end part of your presentation. So uh, Clive, Alexander and Thomas uh, asked very similar questions, but uh, if I summarize it, how do you see the complete life cycle analysis that you spoke of of the CO2 emissions affecting the strategies um, that you've outlined today? Um, so full life cycle analysis is very much the flavor of the month, likely to become the flavor of the decade. Um, it is something that we, Jaguar Land Rover, are taking very seriously and a lot of other car manufacturers as we start to look away from the CO2 targets set on us by governments and aim towards the broader goal of net zero by 2050, because you need to now start considering all these different aspects. Um, there is very much the question as to what does this mean in terms of the shift to electrification? Because when you look at full life cycle analysis, suddenly the advantages of selling an electric car are a lot less than when you're just looking at tailpipe emissions. Um, but the key point and I know that there are a lot of studies out there. I'm not sure that we've publicly published anything, um, but it is something that we are actively looking at and pursuing. Um, but the key point is until it is looked at and regulated, it's going to be something that isn't driving strategic decisions. And so until it is regulated, and so the current regulation only pushes for electric vehicles. That is really the big winner for you to be able to achieve these targets. And until that changes, it won't really be driving any internal strategy decision making. Um, because you can get to that route of 2050 net zero with electric cars. And so that is a route that a lot of car manufacturers are taking. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Murray. Um, not right now. I've, I've got another couple of questions which will probably sort of come, come back to that. Um, so just switching focus briefly, um, Thomas has asked a question um, going back to the, the BEV uh, question. So you showed a chart showing the cost halving by 2030. Um, what do you consider the main factors to be driving that reduction when actually battery demand is increasing at a huge rate? Um, so demand is, is really the key point on there as well. Um, if you look at battery manufacturing inside the European Union, if we're to look at the European Union to start with, it is it is very sparse, and that is a key reason 
for one, where these electric vehicle plants are being built. And then two, it does add to the cost because if you look at transporting batteries, it is prohibitively expensive when you look at the safety features that need to be involved, so on and so forth. And so as we do reach a level of scale, a lot of these costs will start to come down. Um, and so that will help in terms of affordability and the cost of the battery coming down. We also need to remember that as technology improves, the battery technology itself improves, efficiencies improve, that will also all have an impact on bringing these costs down. Thank you. Um, as expected, we've had a couple of questions uh, around hydrogen. Um, so William and, and David have both asked uh, questions surrounding that, and I'll sort of try and summarise both their questions in one. Um, but the heavy duty sector will probably see ice hydrogen, particularly off highway, in addition to maybe a hydrogen fuel cell for heavy commercial vehicles. How do automotive companies write off their huge investments in engine development and manufacturing, skill erosion, uh, but not consider ice uh, hydrogen for, for heavier vehicles such as SUVs? Um, so hydrogen is, is very much in, on the table for a lot of car manufacturers and, and you know we are certainly one of them as, as we've publicly stated it is something we are exploring and it is something that we are looking into um the um i don't know of any commercial vehicles that have gone down the hydrogen ice boot though you know we, we are well aware of it as a technology um the tide has definitely shifted and, and skewed and is skewed towards fuel cell electric vehicles which is where a lot of car manufacturers are putting their money and where a lot of governments are backing it also um, and so that really is where the focus is at the moment. Don't know if you want to add anything to, to the hydrogen question, Lenny. Yeah, I think it's we it's 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 a very interesting uh, topic and and requires a little bit of crystal ball gazing. And I think internally we've we've tried to view it in in sort of three buckets, um, and we're well aware of it. A technical solution and, and largely um, hypothetically it should be very attractive to a, to a customer because it offers them a largely like-for-like -like experience uh, from from the ice engine that they know and use today. The, the other two buckets that we look at are hydrogen availability and hydrogen accessibility and I think that's where we start to challenge ourselves about when hydrogen may become a reality. Um, and we look at that in the lens of the world needs to decarbonize and decarbonize rapidly. And for passenger cars, uh, certainly in the minds of the legislators, um, there is a ready example on the table of battery electric vehicles that, that can accommodate that. Um, but there are other uh, transport sectors such as heavy goods, uh, rail, shipping, aviation, um, as well as heating for home heating that potentially there aren't um, ready-made solutions on the table that are not hydrogen. So we do look at there's there's a queue almost for hydrogen in the world uh, and a whole load of other sectors need to be fulfilled in that queue before we potentially see that proliferating down to be accessible for the passenger car market. Uh, so our initial conclusions are it's not a case of will hydrogen become a reality, it's more when it will become a reality and will that be soon enough for our decarbonisation requirements. Um, and our, on our initial conclusion on that is that we probably can't skip a step, um, that we will go to hydrogen eventually, but we will have to do that via uh, battery electric technology. Okay. Um, there's another a question here uh, from Chen, and he says, it seems like uh, German and Japanese manufacturers are holding on to ice, uh, i.e. BMW and Mazda. Uh, what are the benefits of holding on to ice? Is there anything coming that might throw them off from their strategy? Um, so there's, ice is still a very attractive product to consumers. And so 
when you have something that is attractive to consumers that is generating you a lot of money, then you will continue to invest in that product. Um, it's pretty clear that you're not making as much money when you sell an electric vehicle versus an ICE. An ICE is the most profitable thing that you can sell today, and therefore it will remain a technology to fund future technologies and needs to um, and needs to remain that way, not just for the German manufacturers, but for every manufacturer out there. You know, no one is looking at, at the decline of ICE and thinking this is a good thing, but more how can we manage that so that we move on to the next transition, the next stage of passenger car vehicles. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't view it in a negative light at all. Um, and I do think that there is a place for ICE in the future, um, namely in aiding the transition to that low carbon future that we're all trying to get to. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, next questions come from Alexander, uh, and he asks, um, with a very significant initial additional mass of a battery EV system and the effect on range, what are OEMs doing to reduce the weight of their vehicles? Um, so this is an ongoing work stream um, that all manufacturers are looking at because, of course, you know, the lighter vehicle you have, the more efficient um, the vehicle will be. Um, and so it, it's an active, you know, R&D discussion. Um, car manufacturers are looking at all routes, at every route, because, you know, there'll be cost implications as well to, to lowering the weight of a vehicle, but also safety implications, so you can't go too far in one direction either. Um, car manufacturers are looking at this from every aspect, I guess, is, is the easy answer to, to, to sum that up. No one is looking to is applauding themselves for increasing the weight of their vehicle and it is actively being pursued as a goal in vehicle development from all aspects. Thank you. We've we've got a, a another question um, from different Alexander this time. Uh, what approach is Jaguar Land Rover taking with regard to life cycle analysis? So you've spoken about, about it before and how would Jaguar Land Rover like to see life cycle analysis be applied in the future? Um, I, I guess the first the answer to the first question is it's it's an active work stream within the business and you know no doubt within all car manufacturers we need to lower the entire life cycle emissions of our vehicles um, and I don't know if you want to discuss a bit more in in the framework of, of the science based targets initiatives that all other car manufacturers are signing up to money. Yeah, I think I think that's. That's a useful yeah. in introduction. You know, from from a Jaguar Land Rover perspective, um, our CEO uh, committed the business uh, to science-based targets for 1.5 degrees back in April, um, and probably like a lot of other UK automotive manufacturers, we will uh, be looking to translate that into targets in the run-up to COP26, um, and of course that then governs our, our destiny down to. Um, Paris 2050 requirements uh, from a full life cycle analysis. Um, so we certainly have taken responsibility for that and we will cut our cloth accordingly with our future product lineup um, and, and how we approach that. The second part of the question is how we would like it to be applied in the future and that's certainly one um, that, that we don't particularly have a consensus on at the moment and I think uh, it'll be really interesting to see how the European Union have commissioned their report into creating a life cycle uh, assessment methodology. And um, that, that's not been an easy process. Um, and I, I think from a personal level, we would like to um, demonstrate uh, that this is an area where we don't need regulation because we have it um, under control and we will meet uh, our climate obligations without it, because our sense is a regulation in life cycle assessment um, in terms of how it's applied and how you get down to the supply chain would be an almost impossible task to deliver against because it's just so complicated in the world of building cars um, that it would be counterintuitive to regulate it uh, down to that level. I, I don't know if there's anything you want to add uh, on the back of that, Zara. No, I think you've you've really summed it up. You know, the extent to how life cycle analysis can be used as a regulation tool is is always up for discussion. 
And uh, it's just seen as, as too difficult to bring into practice. There's too many different ways in which it can be done and no real consensus on it for us for it to be able to be regulated at this moment in time. Great. We're going to take the next question out a little bit wider. Um, good question from Gus. To what extent do you think the bans and regulations um, are performative and place the blame on ICE cars as they're the easy target rather than addressing other sources of greenhouse gas emissions? So I, I'll go in on this first, but feel free to, to add on your thoughts at the end, Marie. Um, it's, it's very much a thought within our circles that that cars are seen as an easy target. They are easy to regulate, um, and you know, by by sticking a target on car manufacturers, it's it's definitely seen as an easy thing for governments to then lord and applaud themselves for. Um, but we do need to address all the other aspects and all the other wider implications. So when you compare the regulation put on car manufacturers versus other industries, for instance fuel suppliers, you, you'll definitely see that one is, is more regulated than the other in terms of reducing emissions. And again, it is seen that way because it's seen as an easy win, as an easy target. Um, so, it, I mean, pretty much in line with, with what the question's asking. Great. Okay. Um, bring it back into uh, cars. Uh, Follow up question from David. Tesla, despite many years without effective EV competition and heavy purchase subsidies has lost money from selling cars every year, uh, it's only recently turned a profit by selling credits to other OEMs. Is not the biggest challenge OEMs, can an EV only company find a business model where they can uh, charge deliver, um, sustainable profits? Yeah, so that is absolutely the big challenge um, and it'll be interesting to see how manufacturers reach that stage as as we go through this transition phase over the next 10 to 15 years. Tesla really do only make their money because other car manufacturers cannot meet meet their targets. Um, and they have been heavily involved from all aspects in the credit trading credit trading world, um, which which I've mentioned in the slides nets them billions of dollars. Um, and it is unique in that way, in that it is able to do so um, and, and therefore run its business. But as more manufacturers turn compliant over the next few years, it really is going to be interesting to see how they manage the transition and how other car manufacturers manage the transition, because it's certainly not a sustainable way to run a business. Um, and if it doesn't manage to get ironed out over the next few years, then I, I don't know how they'll manage. Uh, I think it's just worthwhile adding um, that that it's forcing car manufacturers, and you can see it from what Tesla are doing, uh, to look at new business models in the way that they interact with their customers. And traditionally, um, we've worked through um, partners in in a dealer network, and you can certainly see Volvo, for instance, uh, announcing their intention to um, diverge from that model, but not abandon it completely. Um, because as you've seen, Tesla said they didn't need that model, and then then they decided they they did need a showroom presence, um, and are actually increasing that in in the European Union market. Um, but also using the vehicle as a service platform uh, for, for customers. So um, the the sort of major transaction being the purchase of the vehicle, well, how does that change in the future? And um, what can manufacturers offer as features um, throughout a vehicle lifestyle? So it's a, it's a commerce uh, tool throughout its thing. And I think that is, um, a lot of the requirement to diverge from that more traditional sales model into a, a model of the future um, is is driven by um, the view that, that the profitability um, on that traditional model is is certainly challenged as as we go forward. Um, so the next question uh, from from Vikas: Electrification is certainly the key to the future. If BEV uptake is too quick, isn't there a risk that global CO2 will actually rise in the short term due to high CO2 during vehicle manufacturing 
an increase in infrastructure. Uh, for ICE vehicles, CO2 is mainly generated over the vehicle life. So that is a concern for even the NGOs, to be honest. Um, governments are moving this transition to electric vehicles and really pushing this transition um, to try and, 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 you know, get the fleet as green as possible, as early as possible, which will give time for all the older cars to phase out before 2050. But what it doesn't take into account is, is as, as you have stated, um, that actually the longer you drive your car, the better it is for the environment. It's not great for you to have just bought a car two years ago and to already be replacing that car in terms of CO2. Um, and, and so that is a concern that um, driving, driving, forcing customers into new cars too quickly will cause a short-term increase. But when you do look at it from a long-term point of view, it will balance out. And indeed, the earlier that we do move to these greener vehicles, it will give more time for the rest of the fleet to transition. And timing is key in reaching the 2050 target. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got a question uh, from, from Mike. Um, I have a hybrid car. It's averaged 250 miles per gallon over its eight-year life. Uh, should more emphasis be placed on this type of car to achieve a massive CO2 reduction without the major issue of range anxiety? So that's certainly the view of Toyota, um, as probably mentioned in, in my slideshow. Um, the worry is that the technology is perhaps a little bit too late, if I could say that, in that it is certainly a good technology, but it won't it won't be sufficient to meet government aims of net zero by 2050 um, because you will still be consuming fuels, you will still be consuming fossil fuels. And though it is a very efficient technology to reach, it, it's not enough to reach net zero. Thank you. Um, if we go on to got time for two to three more questions. So David has asked a question uh, unfortunately, the key topic of where electrical energy comes from to charge the electric vehicles hasn't really been addressed. I understand uh, that if the current trend to move electric vehicles continues, many countries will have an electrical energy shortage. Is that correct? How is this being addressed? Will renewable energy sources fill the gap or will it force countries to generate more electrical energy from fossil fuel power stations with consequential negative impact on CO2 emissions? a multi-part question there. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the governments that are driving electrification, if we look at the US, if we look at the EU and the UK, and if we look at China to begin with, um, it's pretty clear that they're all aiming in one direction um, and that a move to electric vehicles will be coupled with an improved CO2 in terms of the electricity mix and, and the two will sort of go in symbiosis with each other. Um, it's an interesting question when you look at countries like perhaps India. So India, until pretty recently, had a 2030 ice ban ambition, but it's, it's recently watered that down, you know, a lot. Um, but it does it does raise the question of how they would have bridged that gap and how would they have made up for that shortage. Um, if you look at things from perhaps a different angle and not from a CO2 angle, but more of an energy security angle, a lot of these countries don't want to be relying on importing fossil fuels because you know it, it's costly and it has lots of implications for them. And so by bridging that gap with renewables, which they can make presumably on their own land with their own resources, as opposed to relying on other countries' fossil fuels, if you look at it from an, an energy security argument, it makes a lot more sense for these countries to go their own way and bridge that gap with renewables. But whether or not that is something they will do, I honestly cannot say. Yeah, I think there's another part to, to David's um, to answer David's question is um, we're increasingly looking at um, smart charging um, a, a, as a solution, and um, you know whilst that is something we're discussing in earnest with uh, organisations such as the National Grid in the UK, the sort of the model we would 
expect to see uh, to be exported across uh, many other countries, and that allows for for a number of uh, potentially interesting uh, options in the future. Um, so we can start looking at uh, cars being able to be load balancing across the grid. Uh, the grid is very seasonal in how it approaches, um, and you know, battery storage within cars is not going to be able to cope with seasonality, um, but it does, uh, you know, over a 24-hour to 48-hour period, there is potential um, that, that it can assist in that. But of course, also making sure um, that at five o'clock when everybody arrives home from work, um, suddenly the grid drain doesn't doesn't happen and we can uh, balance that out by uh, talking to, to the cars um, in a clever and more considered way. Okay, um, there was another question that I thought we should talk to. Um, so um, this question says, do you think uh, setting CO2 targets to car manufacturers is the right strategy for decarbonisation of transport? Do you think there is a danger that just more fuel efficient cars might just get to increase use and potentially neglect any COC, CO2 savings from efficiency improvements? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, so to start as whether or not CO2 targets is the right way to decarbonize the transport sector is is a constant discussion point and it will continue to be a discussion point this year next year as the european union rewrites its, its legislation against passenger cars and as the uk sets its legislation in a post-brexit world um i don't think there's any concerns that it will lead to increased use correct me if i'm wrong Marie. i don't think that's been something we've we've highlighted as a concern on our on our end um but Certainly, um, whether it is the right approach and whether it is the best approach is is an ongoing discussion. Yeah, I think our broad hypothesis on 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 that is um, as we drive towards electrification, governments will probably do something to alter the total cost of ownership equation that essentially discourages either longer term ownership of current ice fleet or the current vehicle park than the average is at the moment which is running about 14 15 years um or increased usage of that fleet and you know whether that be through vat on fuel or, or, or you know I, I don't know um but but that's our sort of hypothesis that the governments around the world will look to pull are all levers uh, on that. Um, I think that draws us to a close, and I apologise. There's been loads of great questions out there, and we haven't managed to, to get to them all. But um, Zara, I'd just like to say thank you very much uh, for sharing your insights. Um, I can see by um, the huge list of questions that have arrived that it sparked a lot of interest. Uh, but that that ends. Uh, today's webinar. I'd just like to thank all the participants for taking the time to dial in and listen and interact. Thank you very much.